Mishë të ndëruar zonja e zotrinë për shëndetje, për takomi bashkë në këte edicion të rritërë të këprajmë. Sonte do të kemi një intervjist ekskluzive me ambasadorin e rritë të shtetëve të bashkurat Amerikës në Kosovë, zotin Jeff Hovënje. Mr. Hovënje, it's a pleasure to have you on our RTK Prime show. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you once. Uh, on the first days of your work in Kosovo, you met the leaders of Kosovo institutions. What are the impressions? Well, it was an amazing uh, first day and an amazing first week. First, let me say what an honor it is for me personally and for my country, but for me to come here and serve as the American ambassador to Kosovo. As you may know, I have worked on Kosovo issues throughout my career, and it yeah. felt like such a both honor and a privilege to now return in this capacity. But you know Kosovo very well because you was in Rambouillet in peace conference, then you was in... Uh, a negotiation with the uh, final status of Kosovo in Vienna. So how do you see Kosovo after so many years, from Rambouillet to Vienna and now? It has been a privilege. Um, I first started working on Kosovo, as you rightly pointed out, in the, in the late 90s. Uh, and I was part of our delegation to Rambouillet, did work with Marti Atasari, also worked on Kosovo issues at the White House and the Obama administration. And I'm struck now um, by just how much progress has been made. As I've said in a couple of different ways, including in my Senate testimony, when I was before the Senate uh, for their consideration of my nomination to serve as ambassador, that what the people of Kosovo have achieved, I believe is an extraordinary thing. That you know, next month, Kosovo will celebrate 14 years of independence. And what it has achieved, what the people of Kosovo have achieved in these 14 years, I think it's remarkable. There's still work to be done. And that was part of my conversations with the leadership my, my, my first few days, the chance to hear from them, to hear their priorities. I'm happy to tell you that my sense is our priorities are very, very closely aligned and the things the United States wants to achieve with and for Kosovo are exactly the things that they want to achieve for their country. But did miracle happen, as you said, Mr. Ambassador? I think there is a miracle. If you think back 20 years and you think about the status of this part of the world and you think about what's happening now, a country that is independent and sovereign, a country that is working to improve its economy for its citizens, a country that has established rule of law institutions. You know this better than I do, but if you think about the possibilities one had to be a law enforcement officer or a judge or a prosecutor just a short number of years ago, and you look at what is possible now, and you look at your rule of law system or your law enforcement system or your security forces or your civil society organizations and what they're able to achieve. I think it's a miracle. Now, there's still work to be done to see this miracle furthered. There's still work to be done to see this country increasingly take its place rightfully as a sovereign independent state that, that provides services for all of its citizens. Okay, Mr. Ambassador, before, before we talk for other issues, I want to ask you about the referendum in Serbia that was not allowed to be held in Kosovo. Mr. Ambassador, why you requested that it be allowed to be held in Kosovo as well? Well, the United States and our other partners believe, uh, as we said publicly, that it is appropriate for citizens who have the right to vote in, in Serbian elections in this case be able to exercise their right to do so. These were sensitive issues, obviously, in Kosovo. And a number of years ago, the international community worked with the authorities of Kosovo at the time to come up with an arrangement that would allow uh, people with a right to vote in Serbia to vote in Kosovo. There's been some misunderstanding about what the OSCE mission actually did, because they actually organized or facilitated the elections, not only by transporting ballots, but by actually ensuring the appropriate conduct of the elections in a way that was acceptable to the government of Kosovo at the time. That said, the United States position on this is clear. Kosovo is a sovereign country. Kosovo has the right to determine the terms under which other countries' elections would take place in the territory of Kosovo. We understand and support that. Our hope had been that the government of Kosovo would allow the same arrangement, which we did not believe was a threat to Kosovo's sovereignty. That is not in dispute, and that is absolutely affirmed by the United States and our partners in a hope to allow those people to exercise their, their ability to vote in the Serbian election as well. Yeah. But uh, in Serbia will be held election in April. If it is requested that they to be allowed to held in Kosovo, what will be the American position? The American position, I think, will continue to be what it has been, that we would want to work with the government of Kosovo to find arrangements that are acceptable to the government of Kosovo but that also works so that individuals in Kosovo are able to 
um, vote if they have the right to do so. Yeah. Mr. Ambassador, you have said that you will be committed to strengthening ties between Kosovo and USA. What is the US-Kosovo relationship currently? I think the US-Kosovo relationship currently is quite good. I mean, as you know better than I do, Kosovo is probably the most pro-American country in this part of the world, if not in the entire world. And I've received nothing on a personal basis but welcome and um, expressions of appreciation to me as I've come to serve as ambassador. We have important work to do together. The United States feels very strongly that this process of Kosovo increasingly taking its place um, should advance. The, the government of Kosovo and the people of Kosovo agree with that. Um, we are committed to working with our Kosovo partners to see that happen. And since, you know, I think that is one of the highest priorities of this government, that's also a good sign for our cooperation. Yes, uh, we will talk later for this, but uh, you were the first uh, to attend the Recek message ceremony as U.S. ambassador. What is the message given by this? I thought it was important to be there. As I mentioned in my remarks, I remember that incident quite well. I was at the time the officer at the U.S. mission to the OSCE who was responsible for Kosovo affairs, and I was in close touch because of that job with William Walker, who, an American diplomat, who at the time was heading the OSCE's Kosovo verification mission. Yeah. So I remember vividly both the incident and Ambassador Walker's horror at what he observed. Uh, when President Osmani asked me if I would be willing to attend and willing to give remarks, I was, I, my response was immediate. The United States believes very strongly that we should be clear-eyed about the past. I'm concerned, my government is concerned by efforts by some to seek to revise or denigrate uh, the history, the reality of what happened. And I thought it was an important moment to affirm um, our understanding of what occurred and what it means. But you know what the leadership in Serbia say for the Retro massacre? I'm aware of the views of some, but the United States view of what happened is both clear and is based in fact. Yeah. Let's start for, for dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia, because many people in Kosovo see your arrival here as a step towards an agreement between Kosovo and Serbia. Is it realistic that now we will have more on this, on this, on this, on this way? I think a lot of work has been done, and I think a lot of work remains to be done. And yes, you can take my arrival here as an additional indication of the interest of the United States in helping our partners in Kosovo and in helping the authorities in Serbia to reach uh, an agreement on normalization. The United States believes that this should be a comprehensive agreement um, centered on mutual recognition. That will be what I work towards. I think you can see indications that our European partners as well are, are making every effort uh, in this EU facilitated dialogue uh, to make progress. So you are saying that you are sharing the same goal with EU for the dialogue process? We have had the same goal as the EU for the dialogue process I think from the beginning and that is to see Kosovo take its place um, in the community of countries. Now Kosovo's sovereignty, Kosovo's territorial integrity, those are not in question. Those are, those are established. For USA? I would say those are just historic facts. Kosovo is an independent country. Some people may choose to dispute that, but it just is. Kosovo is a sovereign country. Some people may choose to dispute that, but it just is. And people can argue as much as they want, but the reality, the facts on the ground speak for themselves. The challenge within the dialogue is to come to an appropriate arrangements so that you can reach this normalization, um, this agreement on normalization, uh, as I said, that from a United States perspective um, should be centered yes. in mutual recognition. But uh, in Kosovo, it's, uh, it's hard to believe that can be agreement between Kosovo and Serbia without direct involvement of United States of America. Is there any possibilities to have a special envoy of US from this process? What I would say to that is um, this is a dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia with a lot of help from others. The United States has been and will continue to be active in support of this dialogue. We do believe that it is appropriate that it is EU facilitated. That is not an abdication of American leadership by any stretch of the imagination. It's also a recognition of a reality that Serbia's long-term trajectory and Kosovo's long-term trajectory is in Europe and we believe that it is right for the EU to be the facilitator of this dialogue since it has the ability to make available um, 
the incentives for, for, for coming to this agreement on normalization. I think. Yes, but uh, many people say that with you here in Kosovo, Mr. Chris Hill in Serbia, in Belgrade, and Mr. Skobar for Balkans, will have a, a new dynamic on this process. I think it's fair to say you're going to see uh, not that there has been strong American engagement in the past, but I think it's also fair to say you're going to see strong American engagement now. It would be difficult to identify anyone more familiar with this range of issues and the history of these issues than Chris Hill. And I look forward to the Senate hopefully confirming him soon. Um, I do bring some experience as well, and of course with um, Gabe Escobar, who has been named the Special Representative for the Western Balkans, you also have someone who brings a great deal of experience both regionally and as a diplomat. We want to move this forward, and I think we've been very clear on that. But it's a complicated issue. Is the association with the Serb majority municipalities. How can there be a solution for this? So this is an interesting question, and this has been a long-standing issue in this conversation. I remember from the time of the status talks with under you know, President Atasari, this issue first came up, and I had the honor and the pleasure to lead the negotiations with regard to um, arrangements that would protect um, ethnic communities in Kosovo. So this first came up there, this idea of an association of Serbian municipalities, and if you look at Annex 3 of the Atasari plan, there's even indications of something like this, some ability of municipalities that have been given um, very specific functions because of decentralization, more authorities than municipalities often have out of concern by certain ethnic communities of wanting governance at a local level, to be able to coordinate, to be able to share best practices, to be able to um, have shared training and experience and, and, and share their experiences. The question of what it would be yep. is a question for the government of Kosovo. I would say that even back in the Atasari days, no one had in mind something that would have some sort of an additional layer of government, something with executive functions, something that would, I'm aware of the concern of another Republika Srpska. Nobody is interested in that. That's not helpful for Kosovo, that's not useful. But there are some benefits to coordination. And, I, and one last point on this. Yes. The government of Kosovo has made a commitment for an association of Serb majority municipalities to exist. It was, as I said, an element, although not with that name in the Atasari process, and then of course in the Brussels process and in the Brussels agreements, there's a specific reference to it. It remains the view of my government, I'm not telling you anything new, that the government of Kosovo, that we would expect the government of Kosovo to comply with the commitments it has made, which would mean that we believe there should be an association of Serb majority municipalities. But as We've said many times, including I believe my colleague Matt Palmer to you at this very desk in the past, yes. we don't dictate what it should do and how it should be. That's a sovereign decision for the government of Kosovo. There are models out there that we actually think are workable and we've encouraged the government to think about those models and to look at that issue. Okay, uh, meanwhile Mr. Ambassador, what is the correct current American position on the Washington Agreement signed in white White House by former President Trump and former Prime Minister of Kosovo, Hoti. Well, I'm glad you asked that. Um, this came up in my Senate confirmation hearing as well when Senator Johnson asked me that, more or less that same question. And I'm happy to tell you what I told Senator Johnson. It remains the position of this administration that those Washington commitments were important commitments. And we do look to the authorities of both Pristina and Belgrade to implement them to the, to the extent possible. So you are saying that this agreement should be implemented? I'm saying that the Washington commitments were important commitments, and there's things in them that are very important to see done. There's commitments related to uh, missing persons. There's commitments related to border crossings. There's commitments related to uh, cross-border trade. All of that would be to the benefit, we believe, of both Kosovo and Serbia. Yes. Uh, it's also a big debate is taking place on the Opal Balkans. What is the U.S. position on this project? Should Kosovo be part of it? Because we know what is happening with this. So my colleague um, Gabriel Escobar, the Special Representative for the Western Balkans, has spoken publicly about this already. What I would say is this. Kosovo is an important country, but it is not the largest country in, even in its region. And it has been our advice for a while that any sort of arrangement that would reduce barriers to trade and facilitate the free flow of goods and of people is something worth considering. We are not telling Kosovo exactly which institutional arrangement is best and how best to do that. 
But we do encourage the people of Kosovo and the authorities of Kosovo to, to be open to arrangements that would reduce barriers to trade and would facilitate the free flow of goods and people. Also the big debate is on American gas pipeline. Uh, has Kosovo rejected this MCC project? I think that's probably the wrong way to characterize what has happened. What I would say is the Millennium Challenge Corporation, MCC, has a very unique way of, d of defining its foreign assistance programs. It enters into a dialogue with the government, uh, the host government, wherever it's going to work, and together they identify priorities. It has very strict timelines and it has a very complicated approval process. And in fact, the process to define what's called the compact, which will be the, the MCC's program going forward, is still ongoing. Um, there were fairly strict timelines when there was consideration of gas as an element of the energy portion of the MCC compact. There were fairly strict timelines to determine whether or not gas as an element of that could be supported. The government of Kosovo, which is rightfully doing a fairly thorough and careful study of how it can best transition its energy sources to a, process, to, to a system that is reliant on two Yugoslav era dirty coal burning plants to a 21st century um, it, you know, structure to provide energy, the government wasn't able to come to its decisions on its future energy path on the timelines that MCC requires. That's not necessarily a failure, that's not necessarily something I'm criticizing, it's just a reality. We do look forward to the government of Kosovo coming to some final decisions on its energy strategy. We look forward to being able to support it. Um, in the meantime, the MCC work had to go forward. The MCC compact, if approved, is going to have some very important assistance in support of a better energy infrastructure for Kosovo to help Kosovo have a reliable, dependable, modern 21st century supply of energy. Did you discuss with Prime Minister Kurti this issue? We've discussed the energy strategy, yes, and the U.S. desire to help him with some very difficult decisions to, to help position Kosovo for the future with a better supply of energy. Yeah. Let's talk for other issues. Mr. Ambassador, in the public opinion in Kosovo, is it, it is expected that uh, U.S. blacklist for Kosovo, in addition to criminal gangs, will include politicians and former politicians. Are realistic these expectations? So I, I think you're, ref you're referring to decisions by the U.S. government to put specific sanctions yes. on specific individuals, including some recent decisions that, that sanction specific individuals because of their ties to transnational organized crime. We don't sanction people for political views. We don't sanction people for political activity. We do sanction people if they take acts that are specified either by regulation or law that, um, require, that, that allow for the imposition of sanctions. So if you're destabilizing a political system, if you are engaged in transnational organized crime, anyone who is, um, as we've talked about, involved in transnational organized crime um, should be concerned. That, that, that specific sanctions should be coming their way. Anyone who's challenging a, a constitutional order of a country that we have recognized and worked with should also be concerned. But people expressing their political views should not be concerned. Yes, but uh, if there will be a politicians or former politicians involvement on the, this crime, what will be? Well, the question of whether someone was a politician or not is irrelevant to the question of whether sanctions might be applied to them. So anyone who has been involved in transnational organized crime at a level that meets our threshold for the imposition of sanctions ought to be concerned. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit for the, for the justice system because wetting it's expected to land soon. Will U.S. be the partner and how you see this process? On the question of vetting. Vetting. Yeah. Um, it's a complicated issue uh, and what I would say is it is appropriate and right for this government, as for any government around the world, to want to ensure that its judicial authorities um, are apolitical and are not engaged in activity that would be at variance with the expectations of their community for um, behavior of judicial officials. We, there are international standards and, and there are international guidelines of how best to do that. Our advice to the government of Kosovo has been to use the good offices of the Venice Commission and to take on board recommendations they make before proceeding with taking action, be it regulatory or legislative. Have the benefit of this experience, which will also help ensure that your, that your framework and your actions 
meet the standard that Kosovo will be evaluated against as it pursues um, its eventual membership in the EU. And last question. Uh, Kosovo has made a progress in uh, in the uh, fight against crime and, corrupt and corruption, but how, how you see how far Kosovo has gone with this? Well, I hope Kosovo will go very far with this. Corruption is a huge problem in this region and around the world. Uh, and the United States, we have our own strategy that President Biden announced in combating corruption. We're committed to combating corruption both in the United States and helping our partners around the world to do the same, and we welcome the commitment by this government to deal with this, this problem, which is, of course, not unique in any way, shape, or form to Kosovo. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for the interview. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Nderwar, here is the interview with the exclusive with the Ambassador of the United States of the United States of Kosovo. Pas pak, do të jemi në një panel tjetër për diskutuar për këtë interview, për edhe qështë dhe tjera. Falim derit.